thank you for that introduction. Um, here's an overview of our presentation today. We're, we're, we're going to cover uh, a little bit about the feasibility study and the decision making process. And then that will lead to what Samir will cover, and that is the critical analysis phase and the structural detailing and retrofit phase for this project. So the uh, project I'm going to cover is the I-345 project, which is uh, the, uh, the elevated freeway on the east side of downtown, north of I-30 up to Woodall Rogers. This, uh, the, the bridge was built uh, beginning in 1974 using an innovative design. Um, and our, our presentation will, will cover the feasibility study and the rehab techniques. I wanted, I wanted to outline the team that worked on this project. At, for for TxDOT, we have great direction from Grace Lowe of Advanced Planning, Ray Fisher from Dallas District Bridge Section, and then Mike Heisek and Kevin Prusky from uh, TxDOT's Bridge Division. The PB team included uh, Hewitt Zollers, uh, Wiss Jenny Elster, APM, half associates, and civil associates. Um, all those subs provide a great insight for, for this uh, project. <clears throat> so this uh, the, the project, again, was built in 1974. It used a very innovative design. It mainly used uh, two longitudinal steel girders for each, each roadway <clears throat> that allowed uh, random placement of columns to avoid the uh, street grid, railroads, and whatnot below. <clears throat> so th this is a view of, of the structure. Again, two, two longitudinal girders with floor beams and a very uh, innovative uh, 10 and a half <clears throat> thick um, steel deck, uh, reinforced concrete deck, which was in, uh, innovative for that time. <clears throat> so th through our feasibility study, uh, the the textile scope provided to us wanted to cover and review nine different alternatives from no build uh, to, strength, to strengthening the bridge, to adding columns, strengthening connections, uh, adding longitudinal girders and vent caps, or even we also reviewed a complete replacement of the bridge using either rapid bridge re replacement or fast track replacement or a hybrid alternative and even nine a complete facility reconstruction. As we were uh, doing this fe feasibility study, Tech TxDOT had us do public involvement. There's a, a public meeting where um, some, um, there's a group that was opposed to uh, even having the structure in place. So Tech TxDOT then had to embark on a separate study called Dallas City Map. Uh, which is not the subject of this presentation, but if, if you look at Dallas City Map, you, you, you can find that Tech TxDOT is open to considering removing or doing a, uh, a cut and cover uh, re replacement for this. But what the, in the end, <coughs> this this fe feasibility study will that, that we did um, based on direction from TxDOT, we arrived at using a hybrid alternative which is basically a combination of all these alternatives where we evaluated di different factors and came up with um, <laughs> using a hybrid approach to evaluate the uh, structure. At, at this time, I'll ask Samir to, to come up and explain the approach to the critical analysis phase. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, just follow up on the feasibility study and that, that Bob mentioned there are the uh, proposed uh, solution was to a combination of retro uh, of, um, connection reinforcing and uh, rehabilitation adding girders and so on but the feasibility study was done uh, with the, some level of analysis of only four bridges and for the rehabilitation project, we were tasked to look at the entire 63 bridge units. So the, uh, this is the, uh, the extent, which is uh, 63, we have bridge units, and there are 47 are on the main lane units, 16 are collector ramps units. And when we try to group them, try to minimize the level of work, 
uh, it's just a humongous am amount of work for uh, to review all the uh, connections in the bridge. So we come up with about 52 that are geometrically unique, and that out of the 63, so that tells you there are a lot of units are based on. Uh, there is not a lot of uniformity in the layout and the of the bridges. Uh, this is a just a, a typical, I mean, really nothing typical in this bridge, but uh, um, showing the framing uh, of a unit. It's a two-span unit, and showing the layout of the beams and girders. And for this type of bridge, where there are no bent caps, so all the girders are supported on cantilevering columns. And that's a typical cross-section of the bridge. And the slab is a two-way post-tension slab supported on beams with no mechanical anchors. And, uh, so it's just sitting on the beams and by on its own weight that creates some level of friction. And there are a lot of variability in the bridges on these 52 in terms of the bridge, uh, the width, the length, the span, the uh, spacing, <coughs> uh, the, lay uh, the relative location of the columns, whether they are uh, uh, symmetrically located, or they are, uh, you know, the number of the columns, they are not even necessarily the same from uh, the left girder to the right girder. Uh, so that is just kind of a brief summary of the extent uh, of the geometry showing, uh, you know, the length from almost 100 feet to 500, over uh, 550 feet, and the number of span from 1 to 6, and we have the girders uh, but up to 12 feet. The only, the only constant in, in, this de uh, in this bridge typically is the detail, connection detail. It's basically the same connection detail or some variation in terms of dimensioning, but the concept is the same. <coughs> and that was shown on the couple of, uh, on the photo on the left and shown the uh, detailing of the connection. Basically, all the, the the slab is sitting on is supported on the beams, and the beam top of the beam is above the top of the girder. So the girder is basically supporting the beam and has no contact with the slab. And what you can see, there is a, a gap between the connection of the beam, and it becomes important gap for terms of crack uh, locations between the top, the connection of the beam to the uh, girder. Uh, tip, basically there are three type of connection depending on where the beams and the girder are connected. We have one at the on the left side is connection that is not at the column. The one at the, the central one is at the exterior column and the interior one at the uh, I'm sorry the one on the right is on the interior column. And the main difference uh, is really the uh, whether you have stiffeners on the side of the beam uh, like one single stiffener on the exterior column uh, connections and double stiffeners on or bearing stiffeners on the interior. But as far as the connection itself, the connection plate are basically the same. Uh, so I'm just hi highlighting a couple of uh, areas in green and, uh, and red and that's to look at there is a that small gap between the connection plate on the red and the top of the girder. And that's what we'll be referring to as the upper web gap zone. And then in the green, it, and this one is relevant only to the connections of the columns where that small gap between the connection of the bottom flange of the beam and the stiffener. Um, so this is what we refer to as a lower web gap. Uh, text dot since 2000, and 2000 there have been a lot uh, experiencing the cracks in this bridge, and there have been uh, you know, uh, giving a, a numbering system for all the cracks and description, and just to keep track. And anything that comes new, we have a new number and describing it, and just to keep track. So we started in 2000. Uh, we start first rehabilitation when they uh, after the bridge inspection, they start realizing there are some cracking in the bridge. So. Uh, by when we in 2013 they have about 30 uh, 
they have about 19, 15 types of cracks. So they are different, and each crack is a, um, it could happen, a lot of, basically there are three, lo main three locations are happening. Either in this, what we call the upper web gap zone, this is at the beam and girder connection on the top side, or lower side by <coughs> the beam when it connects to the flange, or on the beam side, which is when they have the cope around the cope of the beam, and that zone is marked in blue. It's just extend a little bit to the first, uh, to the second step. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, repair, but also the other issue that's been finding out is sometimes they do a repair and then there are new cracks that develop because of that repair. So that's um, what we total up the whole number of uh, crack types. There are about 17% of the cracks are a result of a repair. So that means there is something is not that needs to be looked at a little bit further. And <clears throat> it just there are uh, the connection have been classified here just to give the level of of the, give a, a sense of where most of the cracks are occurring. Uh, about oh, more than half of the cracks are occurring, on, occurring in that what they refer to as the upper web gap. And and then on, there are some cracks on, there are the second largest flat, uh, cracks occurring at the <coughs> stiffener, which is at the connection of the beam when it comes to the lower stiffener. And that's shown on right on the uh, in red on the right um, connection detail. Um, also, one of the important things that noticed is the there are about almost 70 type of 70 percent of the cracks are occurring at the interior or at the connection at the interior column or exterior column. Kind of these numbering are becoming important later on when we try to tackle the whole. Uh, Connect the number, the 22 and 48, 2,248 connections. We need to try to bring them all together and try to come up with the retrofit that addresses all the connections. Um, so what the scope of work that we are, that the team has task, been tasked for, for is to have conduct a comprehensive condition assessment of the bridge, <coughs> the entire superstructure, that's including the slab and and, uh, and the steel part of the superstructure as well, uh, including the bearing. And there will be some field required, field instrumentation of the framing system. Uh, there will, the team is tasked to develop 63 three-dimensional uh, th three finite element model of all the 63 bridge units. Uh, there are 2,248 connections that needs to be modeled. Um, and also, we are tasked to develop trial retrofits. So we need to make sure that whatever comes from the model has some sense of reality. It's not just hypothetical, maybe the model works, but you need to test it in the field and learn what you get from the field, calibrate your model, adjust your model, and so at least you have a level of confidence that what you are seeing in the, the numbers is really a realistic uh, representation of what's in the field. And after developing, the, you need to develop these retrofits and obviously develop the PSNE for, for the project. The whole object, the objective of this, obviously, when textiles have been repairing and there are still a lot of connections and cracks keep reoccurring, so the objective of this analysis is really two things: to arrest the and correct any cracking in existing connections and come up with the retrofits that. Sorry come up with retrofits that mitigate connection future distortion stress and, and, and distortion cracks. And the retrofit has to have a minimum life of 25 years. This is for textile direction. Or if you cannot meet that, you need to show that the retrofit has a substantial, caused a substantial reduction in the fatigue stresses. 
So the first target is try to get as, you know, extend the life as much as you can by 25, at minimum of 25 years. So the team looked at, looked at the, uh, the whole project and there are so many connections to design and to, um, to detail. And if I'll just give you an ex a, a, a sense of the amount of time it takes almost eight days to 10 days to completely analyze, design, retrofit, extract everything you need to do from one single connection. So it's going to take a lot of time for us. So we need to develop uh, an approach that will allow us to have uh, a reasonable estimation of what you expect as the behavior of the connections. So, the sorry for the phone, I need to keep... <laughs> I need to. I forgot to turn it off. But <laughs> so, in, uh, what we also need to go in parallel, as I mentioned, since we're doing the condition assessment, we have all of these uh, instrumentation. We needed to make sure our model is reflecting what's in the field and calibrating the model so we can have. Uh, as we, the modeling progresses, we can have them always feel comfortable that there is a good represent, uh, the model is representing what's called, what's the ex bridges experiencing. So we'll quickly go through some of this and get the, uh, the, uh, the outcome of the analysis. So what we use the software, uh, Lucis 50, uh, version 15 at the time. Um, I think any, uh, this is was also in coordination with Dextar, that was recommended, and also it, it has a lot of capabilities. It's not a design software, it's really a good, powerful anal uh, analysis software. And so what we also work with, you know, with Dextar to develop, um, have a, a modeling directive committee chaired by Dextar to make sure that all the design team when approach have the same modeling procedure, have the same consistency in the analysis and consistency in the re, in the extracting the results, and um, and, de and we developed several uh, modeling directives and issued formally by TechStart, so the entire design team will be uh, look, working from the same, uh, you know, with the same approach and. and at least the, the results will be guaranteed that we are don't have a variation from one office to another one. Just quickly go through so what we are seeing for when we did the in-plane instrumentation, which is trying to calibrate the model to reflect the overall behavior of the of this of the bridge in terms of displacement and stresses away from concentration of stress zone. And we calibrate the model for different variables. And the most important one that came out of the first calibration model is that the floor beam behave and the deck behave as a composite section. Even though there is no mechanical anchoring system, but when the truck is close to the bridge, it's push it with the weight, it pushes against the, the beam, and then it becomes acting with the friction as a composite. So that, that's a major thing. Uh, uh, that that defined a lot of uh, you know what's what's going to happen later on. So all the models from the, from that phase uh, moving on are incorporating this finding. Also, then we took the co connections further, defined uh, fine mesh it, where just to now looking at the stresses in the at the connection at a very um, small size mesh. We are talking about half an inch. Mesh. We are having 550 foot long bridge, and we are looking at the uh, stresses within a half an inch. And you can see from one side that we have the uh, the field and the and the model response, and there is a very good <coughs> uh, correlation between what the model is showing us and what you are seeing, what the the field instrumentation is telling us. So what we have, we because of the vari variation in the bridges, we ended up fine meshing and studying 42 connections. That's about 2% only of the connections. Uh, and then now we are tasked from that, how can we project beyond that? How can we make these, the, what we learned from these 42 connections, can we 
uh, expand our knowledge and try to methodically come up with an estimate of how the remaining connection would behave. Uh, we cannot model the 2200 connections. This is just a sample just showing the, uh, the meshing and the, uh, the transition zones, so uh, away from the area of interest. And also, we're always, also for calibrating our models, we always look and after, come up with a retrofit, we install in the field, instrument the connection, read again the different stresses and, dis and deformation, in the, and then bring that to the model, see if the model is also seeing the same thing, try to calibrate the model, make sure all, as we go all along, we are not just keeping it just in terms of modeling only, but we are just making sure that it is tied back to reality. And the last part also will be for uh, then determining the fatigue stresses for the, uh, at the connection. And that's the way we we'll figure out how good the retrofit is, try to project what the life. Uh, can we meet the 25 years? And if we cannot the 25 years, are we having a good reduction? And we'll, just to assess the connection and with the and the retrofits. So what are this for this bridge? The sources of most of the fatigue, of the tra of fatigue cracks are primarily to uh, distortion induced. It's not load induced. In other words, the loading, the stresses are not in plane stresses like you just have a regular beam, and it's just as the the bridge is distorted out of plane, and these stresses are typically not covered in the design. So when you do a regular design, you just do only in-plane stresses. Anything out of plane is not captured by your regular design. Some of these stresses are very high. So we need to have a, the only way to try to retrofit something, you need to understand well how it's behaving. And there are some, as we said, like we looked at the, from the condition assessment, where the cracks, and, cracks are occurring, what nature of the crack, and then try to zoom in on what the behavior and how to improve the behavior to reduce these stresses. Um, like for these, what we are showing on just the bridge, and then we are showing the stresses on that gap on the top, on the left, to the left and to the right of the connection plate. And on these one, you, from the one surface of the girder web on the other surface, and that's just clearly shown it is really out of plane behavior. Uh, the top and the, bar, the the gap is deforming in a double curvature, seeing the stresses of different sign, the magnitude almost the same, it's just your nice double curvature behavior which is out of plane deformation. We just need to make sure that that's what we are seeing and trying to help us understand how to go around and and, and, and retrofit that, these connections. Um, here I'm just gonna play uh, just uh, what is shown on the very top, what you pay attention to the top is really, it's a six inch by 24 inch piece of the girder web where the red uh, rectangle is shown and just to show the deformation as the truck moves. Yes, come on, okay. So that, that, these are, is it work? Yes, it's, I think it's working, right? it's coming. So it just help illustrate what it's hard to see in terms of numbers, but you can see how that piece of web is deforming. And, and, and those are the two peaks correspond to the two peaks of the top of the connection plate. So, and you see the truck moving and, and, and you can see how the bridge is responding. And these are the completely out of plane uh, stresses and, dis and deformation that's seen on the bridge. So the approach then to retro for the retrofit is we need to, there are two ways, either we need to stiffen these areas where the, all these deformation are occurring. If you stiffen it and try to re significantly reduce this deformation, then you can reduce your stresses. Or another approach is to make it very flexible, like we thought, you know, uh, very flexible, then it will allow to deform significantly without 
getting a lot, building up a lot of stresses. And these two approaches, we apply them, uh, uh, both of them depending on the on location. So I'm just going to go quickly through some examples of them uh, where we did. For the upper web gaps, what we did, since there is that gap, we basically created um, uh, a retrofit assembly plate where we almost, for we, we basically extended the connection plate to the top of the of the girder, so and eliminated for all practical purposes that gap. So we closed that gap by adding this uh, uh, plate assembly. For the same thing, we could have done also. We we studied the case where just drill holes, <coughs> where that area where they have a high stress concentration, and and basically connect the holes and make the system very flexible, so the vent, the connection plate can push that up, and rotate it left on you know on, <coughs> on relative to the girder where, but there is really no stress buildup there. And also the same thing on the lower web gap where what we have the beam when it connects to the, the bottom face connect to the girder web and it's surrounded by the two stiffeners. And because we notice this type of crack in this zone occurring only at columns. So away from columns you don't have it. You don't have the bearing stiffener. You don't have something that restrains the movement of the web. So if we release the web from that constraint of the bearing stiffener, you kind of reproduce the condition away from the column, and that's kind of when this is a loosening or making the uh, connection more flexible. Um, so what we did also, the code allows the use for, quickly go through some of this, allow the use of site-specific truck. So we, we know uh, we have about 12 weeks of instrumentation. It did the minor rules, come up with equivalent uh, fatigue truck and it turns out to be it's a whole lot less for at least for these bridges it's about 50 kip truck instead of uh, almost 60 like 54 times 1.15 62 kip so it's almost 20 percent low smaller in terms of load and those are what we use to design the the retrofit um, you know for the fatigue type of stresses for load induced you, have, you can use the SN curve and are primarily developed for in, in plane loading for out of plane loading it's not there so we need to search uh, and you know we it's not directly we'll end up using one of these but it's not a straightforward as it's not stated in the code but based on the uh, research done in Lehigh University with Dr. Fisher, the performance of the uh, uh, the fatigue performance at the toe of the weld, which where most of these cracks are occurring, is the same <coughs> category as the detailed category C. So what, that's what we're going to end up designing all the connections retrofit for a, a constant amplitude fatigue threshold of 10 KSI. So we use the five just simply because we use half of the loading, half of the loading uh, instead of the two times fatigue truck in infinite uh, for uh, uh, infinite life. And the reason we are designing for infinite life because there is the traffic is so huge on this on these bridges that in 25 years you are committed, you have more fatigue cycling than what you would design for infinite life according to Ashto. So, so the 25 years become really infinite life design, at a minimum of regular. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what we ended up with. So here is the, uh, the, the, what we ended up spending quite some time trying to come up with, uh, study the behavior of the connection, the deformation of the connection, try to come up with the, uh, 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 red to, uh, I'm sorry, to come up with parameters that will give us an indication of what kind of stresses we are uh, on, working on level of uh, not, fine, con uh, not finely meshed connections. But since we had developed the full models of the 63 bridges, then we determined that if we have some additional level of refinement, after so different trials and errors, we come up with a, a nice uh, uh, parameter, which is the, the opening and closing of the angle in that gap that will and then we related that to uh, the fatigue stresses stress range and and 
So what we ended up then using all the bridges, uh, connections, uh, on, on the connections, come up with the, uh, refine all the models, come up with the, uh, these the parameters for the distortion, and based on the 42 connections that we fully analyzed to death, and then we know, we, we have a good understanding how the behavior, dis how the connection distort and how the stresses, then we try to come up with uh, a, a projected anal uh, fatigue stresses. We run linear regression analysis on the connections and because the sampling is not very large, 2042 we ended up using statistical, the T distribution instead of normal distribution for statistical analysis to help us understand how to uh, have, you know, how, what's, what's the standard deviation. So what we ended up with working with TechStart, you know, I think the new bridge design, you have a stand of 98% confidence, which is, I think, two and a half standard deviation off the mean. We, for this one, we agreed to have one standard deviation that give us a level of confidence of 84%, and that's the blue line. At least that means when you use these parameters, you have at least confidence 84% of the time that your, your stresses, your estimate will be less than what would bridge or the connection experience. So we use that then now uh, what we did, so we just went on getting all the, apply all of these parameters and then rank all the connections in the 2,248 connections, rank them in order uh, of what we call as upper bound projected stress because we are using it with the augmented from the mean with a standard deviation. And we group these based on our observation the, uh, on the behavior of these, uh, these connections um, on whether we have a connection at the interior column, connection exterior column, adjacent to column or away from column. So we build the data for all of these connections and we sort them independently and say, okay, we're gonna now, these are the highly stressed connection. We're gonna refer to them as a reference connection and we're trying to re try a retrofit. And if the retrofit works on these highly stressed connection, then you would, because they are all generated the same logic, then you expect then the retrofit will work on the uh, connection that are, uh, that are experiencing less stresses. So that's how these are the, what we use, uh, the several connections. And we come up with different, uh, we have different retrofits. So you said the combination of stiffening or loosening of the connections and we did the full, uh, we picked those connections, we did the full analysis of fine mesh connections and we did the extracted the hotspot stresses at the toes of the well and evaluate the connection whether it meets the 25 years or does not. And so I'm just gonna go quick some sample of the proposed retrofit and the labeling is just P1 and P2 doesn't mean anything, it's just really a label, it's just plate. Plate one assembly, plate two assembly with, this is a, a stiffening retrofit of the, of the gap area. The holes are loosening, we call it large diameter hole. And here that's where those according to the behavior of the connections and the ranking, that's how many connections will be retrofitted with those type of retrofits because that's the most suitable if you look at each of sorry look at the, each of the connection and how each of the retrofit behave you can see where that retro that connect, any connection will fit uh, for a best retrofit so we have this type we have another type where at the connection where we cut holes loosen the structure sometimes the connection sometimes is not good enough we need to further loosen it and create and add some holes where there are stress concentration to take them out, analyze. Uh, the, when we looked at the connection, we don't concentrate only at one zone. We looked at the whole connection from top to bottom. All stress concentration will be addressed, uh, fine mesh, hotspot stresses are computed, and we're gonna make sure that when we say this one meets the 25 years, we don't concentrate on one area and forget another area where cracks will occur somewhere else. So the whole connection is looked at it holistically and, and, 
and, and assess the life of the connection. Same thing here, we come up with the locations, uh, and I'm sorry, the numbers, and, and we identify them obviously on the uh, PSME drones. Here, the same type of connections on the beam, we kind of loosen in, loosen the web, increasing the, uh, uh, the opening, make the beam and distortion allow to distort more, but it will build up less terraces. Uh, where we have some uh, well intersection, we you know, just drill holes and remove that intersection of the well so it will not be a source of cracks. On top of that, there are a lot of connections. So these are the new retrofits we come up with, but also we need to assess all the existing retrofits. The retrofits have been installed since 2000. There are several of them, so we picked few connections and same thing, build the fine mesh model, look at the whole the stresses and come up with uh, where, whether those connections are detrimental or are or, 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 or good connections or retrofit. Uh, so the, there are some of these, what we call them the A's, that's the nomenclature that Techstart use for these connections where you kind of stiffening the, uh, have an angles or plate and these trying to resolve some of the problems but we determine through our analysis and some of them also were backed up by the uh, instrumentation in the field that these are not, they are not going to work, they are going to cause more problems and that's why we're about 17% of the connection when they do a retrofit and other cracks occur somewhere else and we've been able to correlate that, uh, the type of cracks and where they are occurring with these type of retrofits. So we recommend these are taken out, also there are other retrofits where they are cause, they are trying to solve a problem because that they solve a problem in, in a location, but they cause problems somewhere else. Like the one on the left, they are concentrating or relieving stresses on the lower part of the connection, creating an increase because it becomes a very stiff connection, you increase stresses somewhere else on the higher part of the connection. So we also remove those. Uh, and there are some of them on other connections, they are in principle good. Some of them maybe are uh, because of uh, Workmanship, so anything, so there are some where we have to call partial removal and remove the other one. So it's a combination. So everything is backed up and everything is analyzed and, 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 and have a backup to why you choose to keep it, why you choose not to keep it. So the, the, this is, these are the two type of retrofit that are good, working good. They, in the, say they have in the field and the end of the model also working well. So we said, okay, we keep them, we don't remove them. So at the end of the day, what Techstart also wanted, just to help them identify on the plan, where are the connections that are still maybe problematic. So we went through all the analysis, so almost 96% of the connection me have met the required minimum 25 years. Uh, so we are only about 4.2 that did not meet the 20 or the infinite life uh, for the connection. And so we kind of broke them down into subcategories. Just instead of giving a, lot, a number of the year, we said, okay, how about if you adjust the confidence? Uh, what are the, in other words, what's the probability that a crack will occur? For the 25 years, you said we have one center deviation, so at least 90, you have about 84%, it will be good. Uh, it will not fail that will not develop cracks. And then we have a couple of intervals, either between 70, 84, 50, 70, and then if it is less than 50% chance that it is gonna work well. So we have only, some of them you cannot. What happened also, bear in mind that by far most of these are uh, due, stresses are due to out of plane, but there are some connections where there is a combination of in-plane and out-of-plane. And in-plane, you cannot do anything about it because that's the loading. You're not going to remove part of the loading of the bridge. Uh, the only one you can play with anything, these distorted stress, distortion stresses that are not accounted in the analysis, but the loading you can restrain or, you know, the deformation, or you can let it more be more flexible and just reduce the stresses. So th that's what we ended up then going through back all the other connections that did not meet the 25 years and, assign, and look at the level of stresses and assign <coughs> a level of confidence. The reason for this, we ended up showing them on plans. So we have a set, another set 
plans and then you look at any connection, like for this one, there are three connections that do not meet the 25 years. And the rectangle is telling them where the location, the square is on the upper web gap, and then the color would tell them what is the level of confidence. So when they do a bridge inspection, they'll be able to maybe focus more and, and spend more time looking at these connections They may be problematic versus all the other ones, instead of going and spend all the, give uh, the same amount of time for a 2248 connection, there are about, you know, uh, 100 or so connections that maybe need to have a special uh, inspection, or uh, not special, but spend more time into looking into them more thoroughly. And, and that will be helpful for, uh, you know, for the inspection team. Um, so what, so right now the, uh, the, re the uh, rehabilitation is in progress and so that's what they expect like about almost two years worth of work and just what this project includes is really the removal of the existing that do, that do not meet the uh, design criteria, installation of the new retrofit, any repair work, anything that's outlined in the, uh, in the uh, plans. And left that one for the projected cost. So the projected cost and the successful bidder were pretty close. You know, that's what we estimated 32 million, the bidder come to be 30 million. Um, so I think that they, am I on time? Yeah, I think we're good. Um, I think that, that's basic, that's, yeah.